we're going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, for instance, how to recognize light so that you can direct the viewer's attention. And we're going to talk about the anatomy of con uh, continuous light. What makes it up? How, what are its parts and pieces so that you can recognize it and work with it? We're going to talk about practicals. And those are very important part of continuous light. And we see them all the time, particularly in cinema. Those are the lights that are in interiors, like a lamp or a sconce or under counter lights. Those are the lights that are always on. So we're going to talk quite a bit about practicals because they add a lot of ambience to our shots. We're going to spend some time on exposure because if we really understand exposure, then we're halfway to uh, being able to create with continuous light and do it effectively. Then I'm going to show some examples of continuous light on location and break those down for you and then move into the studio. And throughout the class, I'm going to talk about planning for post-production. So what am I going to do? What might you want to do in post-production to finish the, the, uh, the image? So let's start with directing attention. Our eyes are always drawn to either the brightest area in a photograph or the darkest area. And that has to do with contrast. Contrast is a great way to direct attention. Another one is type. Anytime there is type or words in a photograph, the eye will go to that immediately. And if it's not important, it will completely distract from the subject. So be very careful with the use of type. And of course, color. Predominant areas of color will draw the eye and focus attention. So here's a street scene, and there's a lot going on. Uh, the main area of the couple, of course, is the woman smoking the cigarette, looking at the gentleman whose back is to us. And our eye tends to go there because she is the brightest part of the image. There's a lot of other things going on. There's a guy in the purple shirt in the background. There's an expecting couple. Uh, a couple of guys in the background, but we don't really pay attention to them because we see them. Then there's this woman over on the right-hand side of the screen, and frankly, she's distracting. So the first part of working in post is to crop her out. Now the image becomes much more effective, and you can see that you really have to focus on the woman wearing the sunglasses smoking the cigarette because she is the brightest part of the image. Here's an example of contrast. Uh, it's a simple silhouette shot up on a bridge. And I really like what's going on with the uh, man and the child. But I also like this mystery guy with the ball cap in the bottom right hand corner. That adds balance and it brings my eye around. So I'm looking at him. I go back up to the uh, pair and then the trees form a nice frame. So these are all ways to direct attention. And this is a very simple silhouette. Um, the way that, um, the way that, um, just a second, I need to kill an announcement here. There we go. Uh, the way that uh, this works is to take a light reading of the sky and use that as the exposure and everything will work out real well for making silhouettes. Love locks. I, I love these. Whenever I find them, I spend a bunch of time taking pictures of them because these are photographs that you can blow up big and you can look at for hours because there's so much going on. And even though there's so much going on, there's even more. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a train going back uh, behind them in the uh, upper third. So these are images that really don't have a point of concentration, yet they have a huge number, particularly because of the writing on the locks. So the type there will draw attention and it allows you to blow this up big like a wall mural and you can stare at it for a long time and get something out of it each time. So here's a portrait I did. I walked up to this gentleman, we were in Paris 
and he was smoking his pipe and I asked him if I could take his picture and he says, oh, no, 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 I'd rather you didn't. And I said, okay, but I really think you've got a great look. And he says, okay, go ahead. So I popped down at his level, took a couple of frames. And of course, I noticed the uh, van in the background with the type on it. And I also knew that this would be a post-production thing that I would be fixing later on. So I went back in post, I just removed that because now you're looking at the gentleman and not worried about what the type on the truck says. For the purposes of this class, most of the images have not been edited in any way. So I think that's really important when we're doing a lighting class uh, so that you can see what's gone on just in the camera. Attention with color and using a slow shutter speed allows the guy in the background to be blurred so he becomes less of an element. Uh, it's late in the afternoon, almost evening, direct sun. And again, the gentleman gave me permission to shoot him and I just took a few shots. Now the type that you see here really isn't distracting even though we know he's got a bottle of Diet Coke and he's got a newspaper and there's some type on his suitcase. But because he is so bright and vibrant, we really don't notice that. And so I didn't bother editing it out. We'll see this picture again later in the show. Let's take a look at what continuous light is made of. And I'm going to use the same subject to explain each type of light. And all pictures won't necessarily have them, but this is how I do architectural photography. So we've got ambient light. That's just a general illumination wherever we happen to be. We've got fill. That's what's used to control contrast. If we add light to a shadow, that lowers contrast. If we put a black card in to subtract light from the shadow, that makes the shadow deeper and increases contrast. Contrast is our choice. It's our creative tool, and we can use that and reflectors are certainly a, a great way to do that. The key light is the direction, the light that actually highlights the brightest part of the picture, the composition that we're doing. So that bright light is what draws the eye. And then, of course, practicals. And again, practicals are lights that exist in the image. When we've got an image that has a practical in it, we really have to pay attention to those because they help set the tone for the overall image. So let's start with ambient light. This is a house that I was commissioned to photograph and I'm sitting up, setting up in a driveway across the street where I asked permission to block it for, oh, half a dozen hours. So this is about four in the afternoon in Atlanta in a July, about three years ago. You'll notice that it's not very interesting. The house is kind of, is magnificent. There's a lot going on, but the contrast of the shadow underneath the eaves on the front is disturbing, but this is the base image. Now over on the right, you'll see guy wires supporting a transformer and a power pole. You'll see these throughout this set of examples. I took them out in the final image, which you will see. So the next one, is the fill. Now for fill, I waited about two hours to get a picture when the sun has just dropped below the horizon line and it's no longer directional. This gives me a shadowless or very close to shadowless light so that I can use that to get rid of any distracting shadows. Now, I wanna call your attention to the light on the porch that is a practical. There's also one in the window to the right and on the two columns over here uh, forming the entryway. And I'm going to go back for a second. And notice you can't see the lights on the top of the columns or the one in that window, but you can barely see the practical on the porch on the entryway. All of those lights are constant. They never change in brightness. What happens is the ambient values lower as it gets darker. 
So now you can see that the practicals, this is, uh, like I say, two hours later, the sun has just dipped below the horizon line. So the practicals are starting to appear. Now we're going to the key light and the key happens to be a little bit before the sun goes down. So here it's at a low angle. It's giving me a bright exposure on one side. I'm getting some shadows, which to me are very, very interesting. And because it's a low angle, it's hitting the leaves in the tree and making them, the trees, making them sparkle. Now you can also see that since this is a brighter image than the fill, this one, you don't see all of the practicals. And then of course, I waited until nine o'clock when all of the light had gone and photographed the practicals individually. And you can see that it's really late by the blue hour images coming through the trees. With these practicals, I now have a separate way of putting them all together into the final image to make a portrait of the house that looks very lively and lived in. So let's review. Here's the ambient exposures, the fill, the key exposure, which is the one that gives you the interest, and the practicals. So those are the four parts of this continuous light. And since I did it over time, I was able to break them apart for you to see which each one is. I, in real life, when I don't have this kind of control, I see these in my head. And for fill, often I'll use a reflector or find something to bounce light in if I need to. Or I know that I can control that in post-production. A good trick for doing fill in post-production is the shadow slider in either the develop module in Lightroom or in the camera raw module in Bridge and Photoshop. So here's the final image. And now you can see all of them put together. There's no longer the big heavy shadow under the eaves. You can see the lights in the house and you can also see some of the modeling of the sunlight on the side of the house. This gives it depth and it really works, particularly when you take a look up in the trees because now they're not just this big shape of green. There's some light in there that's sparkling it and you see some definition on the roof. Now, this picture can't happen in real life because the practicals aren't bright enough to overpower the light of the sun when I'm doing the base exposure, like for the ambient. So in this case, if we were doing movies, we'd have to put really powerful lights in each of those rooms to bring them up. But since it's a still photograph, I can take it into post-production and make it look like this easily. And you'll notice I've removed the uh, guy wires and the transformer. So that's the finished image. And it's a good example of the different types of uh, continuous light. So let's talk about exposure and creativity. And I'm kind of a bugaboo about exposure because um, there's a lot of confusion about what exposure is. I was confused to the point where I went to the dictionary and looked it up and I became even more confused. Exposure, it's a noun and the dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary says, the action of exposure, now understand that a noun is not an action, but in this case they're saying so and it's a verb, but that's okay. The action of exposing a photographic film to light or other radiation, a camera that would give a picture immediately after exposure, that's a Polaroid, I guess, Trial exposures made with a UV filter. None of that makes any sense. The second one, the quantity of light or other radiation reaching a photographic film as determined by shutter speed and lens aperture, an exposure of half a second at F56, for example. All right, that leaves out the sensitivity of the film or the sensor, and it's really out of date because very few people are really shooting on film. However, if there are people here shooting on film, all of this stuff pertains to you as well. So I have, an, uh, I have a definition of exposure that works for me, and I hope it'll work for you. Exposure is the amount of light needed to reveal the true tone of the subject. So whatever the color the subject happens to be is the color that you want to render initially. Now, this is a guideline. 
I like to think of exposure as the base for everything I'm going to do in post-production. If I get the exposure right, I have all the room in the world to make other images and other variations on the image. If I'm fixing exposure in post-production, I'm limiting what I can do creatively, and I'm also potentially putting myself in a box as far as what I can do in post-production. So getting exposure right is very important in, in my world. So let's take a look at this set of images. These were all shot on the same set, and the only difference is the exposures, and each of these is intentional. The idea is that each exposure is correct for what it is, and it's a creative choice. The key is to mean what you're doing. Now, a lot of people have that happy accident of exposure, and it turns out really, really well, even though it wasn't what they had in their head. And the universal answer for that is, I meant to do that. So these were all intentional, but the one in the center is my base exposure. That's where I shot most of the images because I realized that's the one I could use to push to the other two if I needed to. All right, which brings us to metering. And if you're like me, all you want to do is put the needle right in the center. I use needle because I'm old and that's what we had in the original camera meters, but we center the indicator in the viewfinder and that's the proper exposure. Well, it isn't, and I'm, we're going to go through why the, how these work and uh, why the exposure with the needle centered or the indicator centered is not necessarily correct. So reflected meters measure light that's bounced off the subject. This means that the subject influences the meter reading, and we'll get into that in a minute. Camera meters only read reflective light. In other words, the light has to bounce off of something for the meter to see it. And reflected exposures always show as 12.5% gray. Now, for the next section here in this class, I want you to think of everything in black and white. We're not going to worry about color at this point because I want you to think about tones and I'll show you how the reflected meters work. So here are two photographs metered with a reflected meter in the camera. I put it on auto and I aim the viewfinder and the meter at a black card on the left and took the picture. Then I moved to the white card, same light, still again in uh, auto and took the photograph and this is what I got. Now there was texture in the black card and there wasn't in the white one. So that's the difference there. But for all intent and purposes, these are the same values. The black card is overexposed so that it can come up to 12.5% gray, while the white card is underexposed so that it can go down to 12.5% gray. But this is what the light meter sees. Why? Well, there has to be a standard. Meters have to have something to base the exposures on. And in this case, it happens to be 12.5% gray. We've all heard about 18% gray, right? Well, where that came from was Kodak needed to have a reference for quote unquote middle gray. And so they got a bunch of uh, gray cards and laid them out on picnic tables between the hours of 10 and two and invited a bunch of the uh, residents of Rochester over for a picnic lunch. And they said, well, which one is in the middle? Which gray patch visually hits the middle? And everybody picked the one that was marked 18%. Well, that really didn't work well mathematically. And I'll explain that why in a few minutes. So when Photoshop 5.5 came out, the engineers rejiggered it from 18% to 12.5%, and the camera manufacturers very quietly adjusted the same thing. It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference, but you'll see why it works well in just a moment. So 12.5% gray is almost visual middle gray, and that's important. 
So here is a good example of middle gray. It's asphalt in a parking lot. And if you take the readings of it, it comes out almost identically to middle gray. Well, what is middle gray? In Photoshop, it's halfway between the first patch of gray and the last patch of gray. Zero and 255 are black and white uh, respectively. So there are 254 steps of gray in between and 254 divided by two, 127. So that's where the number comes from. So here we see that uh, asphalt against the middle gray in Photoshop. So if we take a white picture, a picture of something white, it's going to be 12 and percent gray in the photo if we trust the light meter. So here's something white, take the picture, reflected meter reading, set that on the camera as the exposure, and this is what we get. Every single time, guaranteed, this is how it works. It has to work some way that is consistent, and this is how the meter works. So here's 12 and percent. This is our starting point. This is our base exposure. But how do we get to white? Well, if we double the amount of light hitting the white card that is being read at 12 and percent, the reflectance doubles twice the amount of light times 12 and percent equals 25 percent. If we double it again, one more f stop, it goes from 25 to 50%. And if we double it one more time, eight times more light, we get to 100%. Now, very quickly, I'm going to run the 18% math for you, or actually, it's arithmetic. So if 1x is 18%, 2x would be 36, 4x would be 72, and 8x would be 144%, which is gross because you can only have 100% exposure even though you'll see an example in a minute that's 100% plus. Now, it works the same way going to the darker portion of the image. If you cut the amount of light in half, the, re the reflectance reduces by half. In this case, I rounded because it gets kind of ugly if we start with 6.25. So we'll just say 6%. Cut another f-stop down so it's getting a quarter of the amount of light, 3% and then uh, one and a half. And finally, our visual black is still has reflectance of about uh, three quarters of a percent. And while our printers can't print that yet, uh, we can actually see it in Photoshop, but for all intent and purposes, this is visual black. So this is the, this is the reflectance chart and how it works based on exposure. So in the center, are the powers. 1x is the base exposure at 12.5%, and all the rest of them are the power you need or need either brighter or darker to get to where you want to be. So that's the reflectance, and up above are the f-stops. So black is minus four stops from 12.5% gray, and white is plus three. So this gives you a visual of how the uh, reflected meter works. Let's go on and talk about each subject individually. So a black subject exposure makes it 12 and percent gray, and it's going to result in an overexposed photo because we're moving that black up four stop, three, four stops to 12 and percent gray. <laughs> So here's a picture of Andrea, and I'm going to take a spot reading of the black. The exposure, 125th at F2. You can write this down if you want to. You don't have to. It's three stops overexposed. But now that black circle, the circle where I've uh, circled it, where I took the exposure, is at 12.5% gray. And what I did was I read the RGB values and averaged them, and sure enough, they came out to 127. Same thing on a white subject, and I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time reading this to you, 
but it gives you the idea of how this works. So I'm going to take the reading on the white patch. Notice that it's gone from F2 to F16. Three stops underexposed. And now again, we're back to almost perfectly 12.5%. In this case, it's an RGB average of 129. Now then, for those of you that are really arithmetic quizzes, which I'm not, 2.55 is a 1% change. So this is well within that range. So it's less than 1% off of middle gray. And of course, the gray subject, if we have a middle gray and take the reading off of it, it's going to be a nearly perfectly exposed photo. There's where we take the reading. The exposure in this one you might want to write down, uh, 125th at F5.6 at 100 ISO. So we've got the perfect exposure, quote unquote, correct. Remember, it's a base image. It's where we're going to start. And visual middle gray is 130. So here are the three readings. And in reality, all three of these are correct for the way they were, uh, the readings were taken. The problem is there's only one of them that reveals the true tone of Andrea's hair, dress, and skin. Okay, this is a white building that is in the parking lot of my favorite pizza parlor in Shambly, Georgia. And I was working on this show and I saw it, I'm going, this is a great example. So let's take a look at this white building and how the, how the exposures work. So here it is divided into the different exposures. And superimpose a grayscale. So taking the root of the camera, this section right here is 12.5%. And you can see as exposure increases, it gets closer and closer to white or as it decreases, it gets closer and closer to black. And here again are the exposure changes. And I shot each one of these on a tripod and made the exposure changes so I could just put them together. And there are the powers. So this is the reflectance chart. And I've put a plus by the 100 because I still say we can't go over 100%, even though we'll do it. And I'll give you an example of what happens when you do that on the background in a minute. So, so here we are at 12.5% or our base exposure. As we increase the exposure, it comes up 25%, 50%, there's 100%, and then finally, uh, plus four, where it's wiped out completely. So somewhere around two and two-thirds stops is going to be the proper exposure. So let's take a look at it. Proper exposure on the right, uh, dark exposure on the left, and reflected meters. Now, how do you know? Well, if you're outside on a bright, sunshiny day, if you keep the sunny 16 rule in your head, you'll know whether or not you're close. On a sunshiny day, the exposure will always be F16, and the shutter speed will always be 1 over the setting of the ISO. So outside with 125 ISO, uh, it's going to be on a bright, sunshiny day, F16 at 1 125th. This is a great way to check your meter and your reading to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And the White House, by the way, was exposed at F16 at, 100, at a, a 1 400th of a second, ISO 400. So that's the example of exposure, and that gives you a really good idea of what's going on as far as how the meter works. Now we're going to go into space and talk about invisible light. Invisible light is really interesting because light is invisible until it hits something. So with all those stars out there, we really don't see anything else until it hits something. Light on a subject is reflected light. Only reflected light can be seen. Invisible light is also known as incident light. 
And this is a great way of making exposures. The incident meter measures the source of illumination. If you know how bright the light is in the room and set that on the exposure of the camera, everything in the room is going to be correct with the possible exceptions of the practicals maybe being overexposed. Invisible light, you've heard the spiel. I'm sure you got the audio. So here are the slides. Light's invisible until it hits something. Light on the subject is always reflected light and only reflected light can be seen. Invisible light is also known as incident light. And once we know how much light there is in a room and set that exposure on the camera, whatever goes in front of the camera doesn't matter because that exposure will always give the correct uh, tone based on the, on the light rather than the subject itself. So it provides the correct exposure and it hits our goal of revealing the subject's true tone. Now, the subject's reflectivity is not a consideration. I can put a black subject in the shot, it will come out black. I can put a white subject in the shot, it will come out white. I can put the two of them together and they will be recorded the way that they actually are. So the incident meter or knowing how much light is in the room or in the scene is a very valuable tool. So the incident meter, we're going to aim the dome at the source of light. And in this case, it's 125th at F56, ISO 100. And this is three incident meters ago. I'm currently using a Sekonic uh, L750 or 858, which is the digital version of this. And that is the proper exposure. It sets the exposure on the camera. And no matter what color subject I put in there, it's going to be the correct exposure. I'll see the correct tone of the subject. All right. I want to emphasize that the exposure on the camera is your creative choice. That's really important. And I'm going, let's go over some creative choices and exposure based on the background. I, I kind of know what you're thinking about getting a white exposure. You're going to say, okay, well, if I put too much light on the background, it's still going to be white. And that's correct, it is. But there are consequences to doing that. And that's what this section is about. So this is an ad shoot for uh, tuxedos for women. And I want you to pay attention to the white roses, the big white roses, and the red ones in the background. Now, the background is at about plus two and two thirds stops. So it's not quite pure white, but it records as white. This shot is plus four stops. So this one is 100% plus 100%. And notice that the roses are starting to turn pink and we're seeing a little tiny bit more detail in the tuxedos, but everything still looks okay. It's still acceptable. Let's go up another stop of light on the background. The foreground exposure is the same. Now the lens is starting to pick up flare from the background because there's so much light coming in from behind that, uh, I mean, we're sitting at plus five f-stops for the background and it's wrapping around and it's filling in the gray, the, I mean, the black of the tuxedos to where it actually looks gray. Notice that the white rose at their feet is now almost without detail. By the time I go to plus six, seven stops, uh, they are completely gray, washed out, and you can barely see the white roses at all. So the amount of exposure in the background is really, really important. If you go much over 100%, you're going to start picking up lens flare, and this is the result. I think this shows this, the tail pretty well. So let's go on location and see how some of these tips and techniques and rules can work. Here's a straight shot of a festival uh, in Brussels in the Grand Place, just ambient light, and the color is totally working for us. It brings the attention right to the person, 
and the bright color of the wheel that she's got there, it's actually a little miniature organ, keeps all of the rest of the background away from our attention, even though they're fairly bright back there. So this is just a good exposure. Back to the love locks, talked about that quite a bit. Again, it's ambient, there's not much difference. And uh, have you seen the train? Good. And then back to this one. Now we have ambient and a key. In this particular Im image, the backgrounds, the couple, the expecting couple and the guy in the purple shirt, they are in shade where the main subjects are in bright sunshine, which is the key light. And that's why the attention goes there. On the streets in Brussels again, and here you have practicals in the background. You can see them. There are uh, lights above the tables. Uh, there's one over on the upper left-hand corner. And the key light is the light hitting the girl that has just taken a bite. And in the foreground, she is framed by two people that are darker. So they become a frame that forces your eye to look at them. And then here are your practicals. So you can get an idea of how having the right exposure really makes a difference. Notre Dame in 2012 before it burned, a lot of practical lights here. You can see them, even the stained glass windows are considered practicals. So it gives you kind of a feel for what is, is happening in an image. And I challenge you to start learning how all of these things work and become visually aware of it. And the best way to do it is take lots of pictures and really look at your images and review them. This is a practice gym in Roswell, Georgia with a friend of mine's daughter getting ready to do a backflip. And I'm using a longer lens so I don't distract her. Again, there's light coming in from the top and I was very careful in choosing where I was I couldn't light, but the kids in the background give more information to the composition. A street performer. Again, the key light is the sun, and the, everything else is really in the shade, particularly the guy looking at him over in the left-hand corner. So this becomes a very effective portrait. Here, the light's coming in from a skylight, and hitting her face and it's just a lovely lovely uh, amount of light and a very pretty candid image she's from Japan I asked her if I could make her photograph and send her a copy when uh, I was finished I got her address and then now that you've had an exam a chance to hear all of the stuff about exposure and everything it brings us back to this one you can see that under the awning in the background we have uh, a little bit of direct key light, but because the subject is moving, it's really not recorded that way. And then, of course, the subject is brightly lit and it's easy to see. So interiors. This is a great example of something being lit with practicals. And quite often doing interiors, that's really the only light that is used. So here everything is balanced and it looks really really good on purpose i left the lights off in the living room so that i didn't draw attention back there so that the two lights hanging over the island would uh, be the stopper as far as the composition is concerned so this is the uh, straight these are straight shots without any editing now the reverse angle i turned on the hall lights so people could see what the entryway looked like. And I added fill to these chairs in the back of the island because it would be too dark and you'd have this really deep, dark black hole where there would be no information and the eye would be drawn there. And here's how it's lit. I've got a portable LED light uh, by Luxley and uh, it's called a cello and it's got a um, uh, a battery in it, a rechargeable battery that, or that's interchangeable, and that just fills that in. Now here's another example of working on location, 
and working with continuous light. This is Peter. He's a musician. This was for a CD that he was putting out. And the base exposure that I just showed you, this one, is with the proper exposure for the light coming through the windows. Well, I don't care about that light. I want to see the dark piano. So I make the creative choice to overexpose everything else and let the idea of having the subject be more contrasty and darker than the surrounds carry the composition. I also added a light, and I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. I added a light to fill in and give it a little more interest. So there's a one by one LED, one foot by one foot LED bouncing into him, pointed directly at him. But once I've got that exposure, he can do whatever he wants to do and I can just keep shooting, even when little Brittany comes in to see what dad's up to. So once the exposure is done, I don't bracket, I lock it down and keep right on shooting. Here's another scene that we did lit exactly the same way. Light streaming in from the background and then a fill light uh, off to the left of the camera as you look to the image. I had to do a lingerie shoot for a magazine and the location I picked was gorgeous, but the light coming through the trees was really horrible. This is bright sunshine and it's coming through trees. So there's soft areas and harsh areas and it really doesn't work very well. So I brought in a diffusion panel. Think of it as a porta cloud that winds up being like overcast light. The fill in the shot of the house is an example. Anywhere inside the shadow of that porta cloud is going to be soft light. If you look at the panel, you can see the bright areas, that's where it's got direct sun, and shaded areas, that's where the sun is blocked by the uh, trees. And here's a reverse angle over the model's shoulder. So you get an idea of what she's seeing. And then here's the finished image. It's very soft. The exposure is changed in order to compensate for the panel, but everything looks really great compared to what it looked like without the panel in there. So doing a little interference with a shot is a really good idea when you're doing continuous light outside. You've got to have a few tools to help you along. Now, this was planned ahead of time. When I'm out street shooting, I don't carry along all this gear. In the studio, here's a lighting setup, and it's using LEDs, which I'm finding very interesting. I've always been a strobe shooter, so this is a lot of fun for me. Now, notice the streaks on the background. That comes from all of these harsh little LEDs. So that's where those light streaks are coming from. And the rest of it's lit with these one by one panels, which is like what I was doing with Peter in the shot. So here's what motion looks Hi, like. Hi, I'm Aria Mathis. My Instagram is Miss underscore Mathis. And some of the amazing photos that you're gonna see today were taken by Mr. Kevin Ames. We did a variety of different looks, but all in the same outfit. So we started with this levitating gypsy. And I know that sounds like an expensive look, but Everything on this outfit was thrifted. So this belt was my mother's several years ago. Uh, and this top and these cool culottes are both from local Atlanta thrift stores. And this beautifully painted mug, as you see here today, was done by our fantastic makeup artist, Miss Gypsy Nichols. Today's shoot was a lot of fun, and I hope it's inspired you to shop locally and get creative with your looks. So that's a promotion that we did, but it shows how the video lighting, the continuous lighting works for video. And I'm gonna to have to wrap up, so I'm gonna run through these. Here, Aria is holding one of those little portable lights to give her a Frankenstein look. Again, it looks like a cell phone with a big battery pack. And here's the gypsy look, one of them, with uh, the crystal ball added courtesy of Photoshop. Here's the background and what that, those little tiny LED lights produce. It's a really great look, so I recommend it, and it's very inexpensive to do. 
We'll drop her in at a crystal ball. And here are a couple of just kicking around shots in the studio. And you can see that continuous light works brilliantly for portraits as well. I'm Kevin Ames. Thanks for your time.